Hailing from the Land of Light, otherwise known as the Ultrastar, a mysterious figure called the Giant of Light came to Earth chasing a space monster called Bemular, who escaped whilst en route to a monster graveyard. Here, the Giant of Light crashed into a VTOL, being part- Is that how you say it, VTOL? Oh, I can't do these videos, the ones, the serious ones that are all like straight-laced and, you know, factual and- uh, FOCUS! Being piloted by Shin Hayata, melding with him to become the legendary hero, Ultraman, vowing to help protect Earth from extraterrestrial threats. That's the backstory to one of Japan's most famous heroes that started all the way back in 1966, a few months even before the original series of Star Trek, just to frame it in some kind of context. And what with season two of the Netflix anime dropping in a couple of weeks, it's a great opportunity to do a recap and review of season one of the Netflix anime. Uh, which if I had to describe in a nutshell, I'd say it's a mixture of classic Ultraman, Iron Man, Men in Black, and a few other things. There's even a serial killer story thread in there. <laughs> the first thing to note is that there are tons of Ultraman sequels and spin-offs between the original series from 1966 and the airing of the Netflix show. But for all intents and purposes, the Netflix show ignores all of that shit and picks up the thread after the original series left off and serves as a direct sequel to that. It also changes a few things. It's based on a manga written by Aichi Shimizu and starts off with an older Shin Hayata visiting the former headquarters of the SSSP, which has been turned into a museum. You see, once the Giant of Light had completed his mission of protecting Earth from alien threats, he left Hayata and returned to his homeworld. This left Hayata with absolutely no memory of these events. From then on, he became a science minister and had a young son, the mother of whom, I don't know, I guess she died because she's nowhere in here. Ah, oh, this food stuck to my headphones. How the fuck that happened? <laughs> So now visiting the old SSSP headquarters, SSSP standing for Science Special Search Party, which has now been turned into an Ultraman museum, like I said, visiting the museum with his young son Shinjiro, Hayata is forced to face the fact that there's something strange about his offspring when the kid falls over a balcony and plummets several floors and only suffers a concussion and a bit of an owie. Like, I think he always knew there was something strange about his kid. He was just kind of like, turned a blind eye to it, you know what I mean? He was, the kid just threw his piano teacher to the fucking moon. Ah, it's just a phase, just a phase. Hayata finds out from his old friend Ide that the SSSP, which is S.H.I.E.L.D. basically, never stopped operating. Ide shows him footage of an airliner exploding 12 years ago and a mysterious figure in the smoke, dressed in armor. Seeing this figure prompts a sudden flood of memories to pour back into his head, and boom, there you go, he remembers his Ultraman. Oh yeah, dude, I saved the world like a hundred times or something. It's also explained here that when he joined with the Giant of Light, he inherited its genes, which were then passed down to his son Shinjiro, which is how he got his powers. Where's the mum? I want to know. Now they refer to this as the Ultraman Factor which is the term used by the SSSP to refer to the power of Ultraman even after the Giant of Light has left them. And obviously this power can be passed down from one generation to the next and gives the bearers superhuman strength, durability, endurance, agility, the ability to generate specium energy, and all this without their exosuit, which are designed to kind of enhance their inherent abilities. Anyway, we jump to 10 years later when Shinjiro is struggling to get a grip on his powers and there seems to be a gulf that's grown between the father and son when Shinjiro finds out that he's been under the eye of Bemula for a while now when Bemula reveals himself and attacks him. The only reason he gives for doing this at this stage is that he's attacking because Shinjiro is about to become Ultraman. It's not a particularly great reason, but it makes sense later. But before Bemula can kill Shinjiro, Shinjai... Shin dives into the scene and reveals himself to be Ultraman. Epic! Okay, so right, the big thing here already is that Bemula has been made into a power suit wearing villain instead of the kaiju creature that he was originally in the original show, right? He looks pretty awesome, doesn't he? And we see how powerful he is as the fight between him and Shin plays out. And eventually, Shin is overpowered when Bemula plunges his clawed hand straight through his chest. Now, if you're wondering about like when Shin rips his jacket off to show his Ultraman suit, why he looks like this instead of like this, well, that's got to do with an alien called Yapul, who we'll come back to later. Very basically, Yapul is a genius designer who designs all this robotic shit, and the SSSP derived their Ultraman armor from his work. So anyway, back to the fight. Seeing the imminent death of his father, Shinjiro tells Ide that he wants to use his powers to help. So Ide is like, oh yeah, I've been waiting for this son, and gives Shinjiro his own Ultraman suit, one that apparently greatly resembles the Giant of Light himself. Bemula forms a giant ball of energy, but Sinjiro uses the classic Ultraman attack called the Specium Beam to blast Bemula's arm clean off, forcing him to retreat. Kind of impressed, actually. 
Then, Sinjiro wakes up in hospital to be greeted by Cocoon Head here. His name is Ido, one of the last of his race called the Zeton, if not the last. Pretty much his whole race was wiped out by Ultraman because the Zetonians tried to invade planet Earth. But now, he's head of the SSSP as part of what's called the Universal Alliance Council. You see, the Earth now has a peace treaty with the Star Cluster Alliance, which is made up of an interstellar alliance of various alien races who maintain peace throughout the universe. Again, this is going to be important later. Anyway, Edo tells Sinjiro that 12 years ago, Bemila resurfaced shortly after the Earth made contact with the Star Cluster Alliance. Other nefarious aliens were drawn to Earth also, almost as if drawn to Bemilar himself. Ido asks Sinjiro to step into the shoes of his father, who's still in hospital, to become Ultraman. We get the first suit up by the power of Grayskull moment, which is awesome as Sinjiro prepares for training. And I'd love to know how this works. Like, it looks like back at the base, the suit is being scanned somehow. So is it being like teleported onto his body? I think the answer you're looking for is who gives a shit? I give a shit? Who asked you anyway? But before training can begin, a real life emergency pops up and Sejiro is thrown in at the deep end. I mean, it's standard save a guy from a burning car, save a woman that's being taken hostage type stuff. But it's here that we meet this guy. He's called Moroboshi and he's set up as the human antagonist who seems to hate the hero for no real reason. But later, he turns out to be slightly more interesting than that. So we'll come back to him. But anyway, Ultraman is given his first real mission to eliminate his first alien, who he finds in a warehouse sucking the guts out of some poor Humi schmoes. Poor Humi. Oh, they're back. This guy is called Adakik. And he's a member of an alien race called the Boltons and possesses mechanical two-pronged plasma weapons on his wrists, which he uses either in melee combat or to fire energy blasts, as well as having this freaky long tongue that he uses to suck people's guts out. <laughs> It comes out in the manga that any nutrients he gains from this, he can kind of get by other means on the alien black market, which means he's doing this for fun. They sucked his brains out. He also seems to have some kind of holographic technology, which he uses to disguise himself as a security guard, and later even creates copies of himself to confuse Sinjiro and like triple his firepower. Anyway, the SSSP guys see that Sinjiro is having a hard time beating the Bolton in a battle that spills out into the city, revealing that aliens are back to the general populace. So they order that the suit's limiter be released, which gives Sinjiro access to extra power, but only for about three minutes. With this extra power, Ultraman instantly cuts off the Bolton's arm and when he clones himself as a measure of last resort, Ultraman leaps into the air and melts them all with a huge blast of specium power. But floating above them, watching the whole thing, is Bemila, who says he's going to move his plan to the next phase. Episode 5 is where the whole serial killer can of worms opens up with this guy, an alien by the name of Igaru, a super fan of pop star Rina Sayama, who herself is coincidentally an Ultraman super fan. So Monkey Boy here is so enamored with Rina that he hunts down anyone who posts shit about her online and turns them into bloody splatters sprayed up the wall of their shitty apartments. Or at least that's the way it seems at first. Funny how there's no blood splatter for the eyes and the mouth. I find that pretty hilarious. It kind of reminds me of that yellow face, you know, that emoji type thing. Shit happens. Moroboshi takes Shinjiro to Alien Town, a part of the city inhabited by aliens disguised as humans, to see an informant working in the illegal alien fighting scene, a big muscly guy called Jack that has been living among the aliens for quite some time now. Now I saw that back in the day, back in the Ultraman continuity, that there was an Ultraman Jack. So is he the next Ultraman? I don't know, just saying, just putting it out there, you know? He is, he definitely is. I read ahead a little bit. Sorry, Sorry if that's a spoiler. spoiler. Then we're into the next mission as Moroboshi supervises a team hunting another murderous alien called Robuton. This kind of floating shell that can fire out energized projectiles and skewer people like this poor Kumi security guard. It begs for its life prompting Shinjiro to question whether he should be simply murdering these aliens even if they are criminals. Death penalty subtext. Moroboshi's view and oh my god this guy's like a frown with a person attached. God is that letting these things live is to risk endangering further human life and he does seem like a kind of Captain Ahab type character hell-bent on eradicating aliens for some reason that's not known at this stage. Interestingly, he says to Sinjiro that he's not the only one that could be Ultraman. Seems like kind of a catty remark though. Anyone can be Ultraman. But mostly, hmm, where's this going? I smell multiple Ultramans. Multraman, multi-Ultraman, get it? I put them together. <laughs> Back with the serial killer storyline, all signs have so far been pointing to Little Monkey Man here being the culprit. But when these two cops here manage to lure the killer out by posting trolley messages on the Popstar's webpage, it turns out to be this guy called Briss. He 
shows off his fancy laser arms that if you remember can reduce you down to just a bloody splash mark on the wall and is about to liquefy the detectives when these two, I don't know what you would call these things, smash through the window in a bed in the wall. Turns out they were fired by Moroboshi and yes, Moltraman! He has his own suit of armor and calls himself Ultraman also. And he's pretty powerful. He blasts out a wave of energy from his katana that makes Mama. Makes the surrounding trees sway and dispatches Briss pretty easily. Moroboshi later tells Shinjiro that this is the seventh version of the Ultraman suit. So they end up calling him Seven. <laughs> seven of nine, lucky number seven. Kevin Spacey was in seven. I've lost track of what I'm talking about, clearly. <laughs> So I guess that that is where they're taking this. Just like the Iron Man suits, we have different marks that have different abilities. And I can't wait to see the Kaiju Buster armor. Speaking of Kaiju, Ep7 starts out with our first real Kaiju attack. Although this guy, called Black King, is pretty small for a Kaiju. And there's something about the way his skin is rendered that I'm not exactly crazy about. So, you know, a little bit of a letdown in the kaiju sex there. Anyway, Shinjiro's having the same old issues when it comes to killing the guy off until the kaiju throws him into a group of innocent bystanders, which does two things. Helps him discover his ability to fly and pisses him off to the point that he slices the kaiju's head off with the laser blades on his forearms, which are awesome, by the way. I wonder what these things are called. Then we're introduced to this guy, whose voice sounds a lot like the chief. Listen. This audience is in for a show they'll never forget. And yeah, this guy loves monologuing. Anyway, he shows up backstage at Arena Concert, so talking about pinning the murders on the little monkey guy. Let's talk about him for a second. He's just known as Igaru in the show, but I'm pretty sure his planet is called Igaru, and his real name is Pigmon. Now, Igaru was from royalty before coming to Earth, and was even his race's representative to the Star Cluster Council Alliance. His people were peaceful, and because of that, they were exploited politically, and then wiped out. I don't know if it's ever mentioned why or where or by whom, but it's kind of an aside anyway. Anyway, back to this guy. This guy is called Agent Adad. Hi. He's from a race called the Scooter, and he is an agent of the Star Cluster Council. But that being said, he's kind of a shady character as his methods are often pretty brutal. He's on Earth with several objectives, among them searching for a genius called Yapul, who I mentioned earlier, remember? And also monitoring a certain Bemular. So yeah, he reveals himself at the Rena show where Shinjiro and Moroboshi make their move on the big scary alien. And yeah, these martial arts sequences are really well done. This guy can easily hold his own against two Ultramen, and their task only gets tougher with the appearance of Bemula. Bum, bum, bum. Don't I have a squirrel for this? Where's the squirrel? <laughs> I'm gonna rip open your jugular and yes, it! All right, all right, you've done your job. Get out of here, fucking diva squirrel. Just because he went viral like 10 years ago, he's still all up his own ass. But I really am concerned that most people ain't gonna make it through 20 minutes of this shit in one go. So I'm gonna split it down. I'll have part two uploaded in a few days. So I will see you very soon for the next one. Thank you very much for watching and cheerio, bye.